Good morning, church. I am Pastor Terry Milstead, and Pastor Dale Clem and Pastor Reed Turner are here with us as well this morning. I welcome you who are joining us in person and those who might be with us online this morning. If you are here, there are pew pads on your pew. If you would, at some point during the service, take a moment, register your attendance, and also there are prayer concern cards in the pews as well. If you have one that you would like to turn in and see printed in the bulletin, We can join you in praying for whatever your concern is. Now let us begin our worship with our call to worship. Would you please stand? Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great ruler over all the earth. Now if you remain standing for our hymn of praise, Holy God, we praise thy name. Let us remain standing as we join our voices together to affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we're just so glad to have everyone in worship with us today. And, and we want to lift up some announcements that are happening in the life of the church. Our Burger Dog Talent Show is going to be Wednesday, uh, July the 7th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we're still looking for people who want to share their talent. So if you are interested in doing that, uh, you can contact the church office. Our deadline to register for dinner is going to be Monday. July the 5th. We're also going to have a volunteer ministry fair on uh, July the 11th at 9:45 in the fellowship hall. And so, if uh, one of if a ministry that you are involved in has some opportunities uh, where they're looking for volunteers or different ways people can serve, uh, we let us know because we know that there are a lot of good ministries uh, going on in the life of the church, and we don't want to miss the different. Uh, volunteer service opportunities that we have here. And also, um, you should have gotten in your bulletin, I think there was a, a insert with uh, talking about our James Spann uh, coming on J Sunday, July the 18th. Uh, and what we want everyone to do is take this and give it to someone that we know so that they too will uh, hopefully come and join us in worship uh, so that we can come together and we can make it a, a, a big Sunday and, and uh, just a great opportunity to come together on that day. And if you are looking for any more information or any other announcements, you can look inside your bulletin or on our weekly newsletter. And so I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward uh, as we have come to a time of offering. Uh, and because of your generosity, our church is able to provide a safe and secure place to support families which are struggling with addiction. Sometimes unknowingly, family members uh, enable addictive behaviors. Fortunately, through education, support, and fellowship, Al-Anon gives persons the tools they need to help families and find solutions to addictive behaviors. Let us pray. Gracious God, we just ask that you bless these gifts that we are about to receive so that we as your church can continue to do the ministries in which you put before us so that we can help build your kingdom here and now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
as we go to God in prayer, let us pray. Creator Spirit, shine on us like the sun that lights up the day. Chase away the shadows of doubt and distraction so we can be awake to hear your word and experience your presence as we worship you this day. We give thanks for the music that, that, we've, that, we, that we've sung and that we've just heard, that it will awaken us to praise you. We know, O oh God, that your constant love is better than life itself. But so often we aren't aware of your love because we're so busy in our lives and we listen to the news and see the, the difficulties that so many people are experiencing. Help us, O oh God, to look around at the positives in our midst so we can give thanks to you for the joys of life, for the grace which sustains us and has sustained us and will sustain us in the future. You said to us, come to me all who were weary, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Some of us come today with heavy burdens. We pray for those who are sick, who are, who are undergoing surgery or recovering from surgery, who are going through different therapies and live in fear. We lift up those we know who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. We lift up those who are grieving the loss of property, friends, or family. Especially we, we lift up those friends in, in, in Florida who are, who are suffering because of the collapse of the condo. Comfort and send your healing mercies on all those we have named aloud and those who we name in our hearts. Circle us, Lord. Keep strife without and keep peace within. Keep fear without. Keep hope within. Keep pride without and keep trust within. Keep harm without. Keep good within. May we walk in the hope of your kingdom as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time now for our Children's Minute. We invite any kids to come up for a Children's Minute. And Miss Bird is coming. Do I announce the hymn or do you do that?
Amen. We've now come to a time uh, for our hymn of preparation. So let us stand as you are able as we join our voices together. Please remain standing and pray with me the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your heart proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture for today comes from 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 15. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job with his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, This is Bathsheba, 
daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Job. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Job and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all of the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Well, welcome, Leanne, to Alabaster First United Methodist Church in, in our worship service. Thank you for having me. And by the way, thank you to your church for supporting Safe House and Safe Shelby. We appreciate everything you do for us, especially the personal items you've collected. Well, you're very welcome. Well, we appreciate your work. If without you in the community, we would we would not have a place to turn to for people in need. So thank you for your service. Thank you. Well, as you know, today we're talking about the story of David and Bathsheba. In many ways, throughout David's life, he made a lot of good choices, and we've been talking about those in worship mm -hmm. over the last few weeks. But uh, in this situation, in this story, he did not make some good choices and he took advantage of his power and position with Bathsheba. You work at Safe House with women who've experienced violence of one sort or another. From your experience, what do you think Bathsheba may have been feeling? Well, um, you know, most women who've experienced some sort of abuse or violence have a variety of emotions. You know, I think Bathsheba probably felt violated because she loved her husband but was forced to be with the king she probably felt trapped she didn't know she couldn't say no to the king um and so she was you know she was in a difficult situation yeah. even though she may have had some questionable behavior she still found herself in a situation where she couldn't say no and then when her husband died in battle she would have just been overwhelmed with grief and you know, I don't think she ever knew that David had had him killed. And if she had, um, that would have complicated her grief so much more. Right, sure. Well, do you think she may have experienced some kind of self-blame? I know we do that sometimes. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, often victims of sexual assault do blame themselves and that happens almost immediately. And, you know, they think things like, well, I shouldn't have done this, or I shouldn't have done that. Or with Bathsheba, she probably immediately thought, I shouldn't have been bathing on that roof. 
um, you know, and outsiders are really quick to blame victims and say unhelpful things like, well, she shouldn't have worn that outfit or she shouldn't have been there or, you know, we've all said this one, well, what does she think would happen? But the truth is that most sexual assault happens at the hands of someone the victim knows and trusts. And of course, trust is good. It is a wonderful trait. Um, but the other people, the other person, the abuser may have told them things they knew what to say, they knew how to um, play on their emotions to gain their trust, so they believed them. You know, emotional connection and trust can happen very quickly and we're blinded to the warning signs. You know, from the outside, we, we can say, well, what did she think would happen? But, you know, people can gain our trust very quickly and, right. you know, what does she expect to happen? Well, you know, um, women expect to have fun, to have dinner, to have friendship, possibly a romance. They don't expect to be raped. Right. And so, you know, then in retrospect, they see the signs and they blame themselves, which brings on even more shame. Right. And, you know, I'd just like to add that sexual abuse by a family member or a longtime friend or other trusted adults such as King David causes profound and long-term emotional damage. Mm. Well, I know that uh, it's, it's a terrible thing. What, I, I think it's important to say to everyone, you deserve better than to allow another person to hit you or to be violent towards you. Um, you deserve better. You know, there's a way out. There's safe places you can go, kind of like safe house where you, where you work. Um, I know on the long term, it's just so hard to heal from from being mm -hmm. violated. Um, what are what is your in your experience? What are what are some things people can do to heal from their abuse? Yeah, well, you know, um, victims unfortunately often try to deal with the abuse alone. They believe they can fix their abuser, or they're trying to keep their vows of marriage, or you know, or promises they've made. And often they're very fearful of the abuser. You know, they may be fearful of the community's response, their family's response. They're, you know, they're already embarrassed enough by what's happened. And so sexual assault victims are especially ashamed and afraid of being blamed. Mm -hmm. Most often the abuser has gained their trust and it happened so quickly they didn't know what to do. So you know, we have to start with that and then move forward. Healing is a very long process, but it is possible. And the first step is to reach out for help, to ask someone for help. And even if the abuse happened a long time ago, our counselors are still here to help. So um, we can start them on that journey to healing. It is a tale as old as time and it is infuriating. And it was made no less infuriating for me this week as I studied this text to prepare for today. In the story of David and Bathsheba, we witness a woman and how she is portrayed as merely an object. She is beautiful and she is a bathing object. A woman who has a name but quickly loses it and is referred to only in reference to whose daughter she is or whose wife she is. A woman who is acted upon, and then if you were to read what various biblical scholars have had to say about this passage, she is a woman who is made to carry the blame, in whole or in part, for what happens to her. Dr. Bruce C. Birch points this out in his commentary on the text. At least one biblical scholar, a male biblical scholar, I will say, has said that her actions bathing on that roof of her own home were a feminine flirtation, that she intended to be seen and desired by the king. Another scholar, a male scholar, said that her actions can hardly indicate less than contributory negligence on her part. It's a tale as old as time, and it is infuriating. 
In Pastor Dale's interview with Leanne Knight from Safe Shelby, we heard her reflect on how those who find themselves to be outside observers of physical, mental, or sexual assault today, just like those biblical scholars I mentioned, outsiders are quick to blame the victim, saying things like, what did she think was going to happen? And this assumed community response to what has happened to them, leave these women who suffer physical, mental, or sexual abuse. Today, they quickly believe that they are to blame for whatever happened to them. And as a result, they carry around shame and guilt, and many will feel trapped in ongoing abusive situations. When the pastors were discussing this David sermon series, I remember the conversation quite clearly. Pastor Dale outlined it like this. He said, okay, in our first week, we're going to talk about David, the anointed shepherd king. Then we will talk about David facing Goliath, and that gives us an opportunity to talk about how we all face giants in our lives. Then we can talk about David and Jonathan and the importance of friendship. Then, David and Bathsheba, and sexual assault. I mean, I think I just heard the record scratch at that moment, like, Arr! And if the conversation continued, I wasn't hearing it for a little while. And I, I, I remember I looked at our preaching schedule, and I was hoping that it was a week that I was off. Clearly it was not. And then I thought, who can we talk to that would be willing to share their story? I don't have one. Well, as you saw, we ended up talking to Leanne, but in preparing for this week, I decided that I do have a story to share. Now, it's a minor story compared to the stories that so many others have, stories some of you might have. And these are not stories that we tend to share with one another. Self-blame and guilt keep us quiet. Here's my story. As many of you know, I'm a tax accountant, and I worked for years in a large accounting firm in downtown Birmingham. And just a few years into my work there, I had the opportunity to work on an account that had not just one tax partner involved, but two. One was my boss, who I worked with every day, and another was a man who used to be in the Birmingham office. He had moved away, but he would come in to town once a quarter, and we would have a meeting with our client. Whenever we had that meeting, we would meet for a day, and then usually at night, those two partners who had worked together for years, they would go out to a nice dinner. Now, as a young professional, one year I was invited to go to dinner with them, and I was just thrilled with the opportunity to have this chance to network with these two men. That night, however, dinner, which included several drinks, turned into shooting pool at a grimy bar. And at one point, my boss was somewhere else, and the other partner turned to me, and let's just say he made a very inappropriate comment. For whatever reason, and I thank God to this day, for whatever reason, my reaction was to laugh in his face and to quickly leave. The whole way home, I blamed myself for being in a situation I should not have been in. And I wondered how many other young professional women had not gotten out, but had fallen victim to this man who clearly had power and authority over their careers. The next week, I told my boss what had happened. And do you want to know what he told me? He told me that man was having a hard time. And then he said, <laughs> his wife has a drinking problem. It still floors me. Somehow, not only was what he had done and said excusable, but it was blamable on his wife. It's a tale as old as time, and it's infuriating. 
Women are not objects to be gazed upon, desired, and taken at will. No one is. Power and authority are not to be abused for the satisfaction of your own selfish desires. It is interesting how this story has not only been analyzed by scholars in order to cast blame, or at least part of it, upon Bathsheba, but how this story has been absolutely fictionalized so that our hero, King David, would not be seen as the bad guy. Dr. Birch points out in his commentary several different ways that this has happened. Did you know that rabbis sometimes taught that David's actions were just righting the wrong that occurred because this Israelite woman was married to a foreigner, a Hittite. A Hittite, you will note, who was off fighting the king's battles for him while he sat at home in his palace and who refused to go home to lie with his own wife while the army was still gathered for war. There are movies which create whole backstories to make what seemed happened like it, it was excusable and even commendable. One movie portrays Bathsheba as an abused wife who needed to get away from her husband. In others, they just romanticize it beyond anything that the text actually says. These romanticized fictions are not what the story is. As Birch put it so well, romance does not begin with taking and end with murder. David and Bathsheba do not belong in a list of romantic couples like Antony and Cleopatra and Romeo and Juliet. They do not. The last verse of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, the verse that follows what we start to see taking shape, the verse that follows the ones that tell us that Uriah was indeed killed in battle after David put him on the front, the last verse of chapter 11 clearly tells us that this is not a romance. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. In chapter 12, Nathan, the prophet, has to come and give David an object lesson to show him the error of his ways. And he said to him, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do evil the story is not about a woman beguiling a man with her feminine wiles. It is a story about a man who saw something he wanted, sent for it, and took it. He had the power to do all of these things. You know, Samuel, who had anointed David and saw before him, he saw what could happen, and he had warned Israel. This is what he said. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your female slave, of your vineyards. He will take your male and your female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. David took because he could. And then when what he had taken for a moment created an even bigger scandal, he just took and he took and he took some more because he could. David's words from last week in that song upon the death of Saul and Jonathan, they should be ringing in our ears this morning. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Because from this time on, David's story is one of woe and struggle. The sins that he has committed, they just seem to permeate his entire family, and his days are fraught with discord and dysfunction. It is a tale as old as time, and it is infuriating, but it can be instructive to us today. 
This is not a story that just allows us to find another flawed hero in the Bible to point a finger at. It is a story that allows us to see how we must keep a guard on our impulses and our desires, particularly when we have the power and authority to assert ourselves over others to get whatever we desire. Now, we might not think that we have power and authority like David. We weren't wearing a crown and robes of purple. But don't be so quick to think you have no power. One of the things that we are taught as pastors is that we have power and authority because of our title and our positions, whether we think we do or not. We have to be mindful of how we interact with others as a result. It would do us all good to consider what power and authority we do hold. David may have thought that he sent for Bathsheba and she willingly came. But we all know that the imbalance of power made it highly unlikely that that was true. Take care that you, too, do not believe that the ways that people interact with you are absent of the impact that your power and position has over them. It is a tale as old as time. And it is infuriating, but it is one that we can work to avoid in our own lives. We should work to avoid in our own lives. So this morning, I pray that our eyes are open to our own tendencies to judge what we hear, to cast blame on victims, to be a party to others feeling trapped and helpless. I pray, too, that our eyes are open to our own tendencies to take what we want, to exert our power and authority in ways that manipulate and control, and thereby to open a door to a spiral of sin and misery for ourselves and others. May the Spirit grant us the needed wisdom and insight to avoid these traps. May Jesus' way of light and life be our ways. May all we do give glory to God, and may we serve one another in true love and true care. Let us pray. Merciful Father, this morning we are so thankful that the authors of Scripture included this story. It would have been so easy to glance over it so that your anointed king would seem more perfect than he was. We know that later he becomes repentant and contrite, but the sin had done its damage. So we are thankful for the truth that we find in Scripture. And we ask that you go with us in our lives, that you help us protect and care for others, that you would help us hear their stories and believe them and work to defend them. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes to all of the power and privilege that we each have, that we might use it wisely in service to others, not to manipulate. Thank you, Lord, for this story. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. In your son's name we pray. Amen. If you would stand for our closing hymn, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord.
May we go from this place today seeing each and every person as a sacred, beloved child of God. May we not be ones who victimize and may be, be ones who help those who are victims. Go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.